you, you just gave me five more years possibly to teach. Mm. Your testimony is what motivates me. On the spot, at the spot. The spot, Soto. With the big homie Nick, we at the spot, Soto. We at the spot, Soto. Spot, Soto. On the spot, at the spot, Soto, Seattle. Man, pull out your blunt, grab your drink, get your notepad. Cause it's a lot of game. It's a lot of game. Man, shit, we over here on the spot after the spot, man. Hey, don't get it twisted, nigga. This is just juice in the cup, man. You feel me? <laughs> on the real. Man, we got a, man, great show. Probably going to be one of my favorite episodes, man. I got, man, you know, McGlover. Yeah. And then, you know what I'm saying? Normally, man, you know, I might, I would normally have somebody go and say their name or whatever. Let me, let me, let me take this one, man. Let me take this one right here. First and foremost, I just want to say, man, We've got a real stand-up black God, not king, God. Because a God is somebody that can implant something in each and every person. We've got a real one, man. Oregon State alumni, Inglewood High School alumni, Inglewood Native alumni, father to some of the realest and hardest motherfuckers, and excuse me while it's me saying that, but I'm gonna be real, to come up out of the South Bay, Inglewood, LA area, the one and only. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna put doctor in front, even though he may not have the credential, but that's what he is to us. Dr. Tedrick Johnson. I wanna thank you for that um, tremendous intro. And first and foremost, let me start off by saying this. You having me here is such a tremendous blessing and such a humbling experience. I want to give you and your staff a shout out for just accepting me, inviting me, and just providing me with so, so much um, comfort and acceptance here. So that's been a tremendous, tremendous um uh, journey thus far so thank you for that everyone's just been extremely nice gracious and um courteous so i want to extend man, that bless, bless us, man. like comment and subscribe man this is going to be an episode man you know what i'm saying it's going to be a real good episode we're going to touch on a lot of key points but again man first point man hey man where you from man where you up out of man that's going to be the first one good inglewood I Inglewood. Okay. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> yeah, we got a hey, Bosco. We found another one. <laughs> Inglewood, born and raised. Um, my family and I moved to Inglewood in 1972. I know I'm dating myself. Uh, we moved adjacent to what is now known as Edward Vincent Park. Back then, it was Sitinella Park. Sitinella. Absolutely, second black family um, on our on our street. First grade. 1972. Uh, it was a tremendous experience. Back then, Inglewood was predominantly white. Right. Yeah. So the, the school experience was was unique, a little bit different. But uh, Inglewood and, and everyone who knows me personally knows that I I really accept my roots and, and I'm fond of being from Inglewood and there's no shame in that. I, I promote that as much as I can. When did the um like the black start more migrating towards Inglewood? What what would you would you say? Around that time. Around that time. That was the time. Early seventies, early to mid seventies. Where's your um where's your family roots from? Where, where you guys up out of? Louisiana. I figured. I figured yeah. you were crazy, man. What part? Uh, Monroe and Menden, Louisiana. No. Absolutely. That that's where my parents are from, but my siblings and I were all born in, in, in SoCal. Okay, okay. But, but my parents hail from Louisiana. You know what's funny about that, huh? You know that's where uh, Donnell, really? all my uncle, they all up out of Monroe. Wow. They own stupid property out there. Stupid. Property. Wow. Hey, you, oh man, let me find out you related to Donnell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be ironic? Man, yeah. nah, man. It ain't too far fetched. Yeah, you know? for real, for real. Absolutely, absolutely. So, man, you know what I mean? The genetic makeup, man. What's your What's your number one love sport, man? Football. Dig that. Football. Um, I was raised in a household of uh, we had to choose something positive in order to stay on task and k 
keep that structure going. Yeah. So I have an older brother who was into sports. So growing up, we played all three sports, football, baseball, basketball. When one particular sport was over, just rolled over into the next. And it created um, a positive environment, and it, it, it kept people, um, some of the wrong people, out of my life because they respected athletes, so, you know, at that particular time. Yeah. You know, they made sure they looked out for us and encouraged us to do the right thing, to go to class, uh, to stay away from um, negative things that could have an adverse effect on what we were doing or trying to accomplish. So I definitely um, inherited that, and it, and it transcended into my daily uh, um, life situations. What I mean by that is you had to instill time management, uh, you had to have hard work, you had to dedicate, you had to take care of your body. So that just rolled over into my everyday life. So, okay, how did you, because you, you, you brought up a good point, and it, it is true, especially, you know, in L.A., what a lot of people don't know, when you are an athlete, it does negate some of the the, the, the older men, you know, ah, oh, nah, man, that nigga a baller. Because that was going to be my next question, because, you know, you're coming up in them, them 70s and them 80s, man, when it was, man, it was treacherous, man. Extremely treacherous. Um, many of the people that I grew up with, man, endured some of those challenges that you just mentioned and kind of sidetracked them, man. We, we lost a lot of soldiers um, through our journey. You know, they were not fortunate enough, you know, to um, be able to um, withstand some of those tendencies, man, you know, um, the drugs, the gang violence. Uh, but those OGs, triple OGs, they looked out for us. Yeah. They made sure we had a safe passage to and from school and, and took care of us once we were on campus. Let me ask you this, because it seemed like we, we went from Inglewood, you moving to Inglewood, and it being predominantly white, Caucasian. Then we, we fast forwarded to the violence, you know what I mean? That middle part, the transition from white flight to now it's, it's gangs, you know what I mean? Where, where once was, you know, these neighborhoods, you know what I mean, thriving neighborhoods, now it's turned. Did you, do you remember the, the transition around the time? Like what time did it start, the tide start turning? That's a great question. And I vividly remember, because we used to play at Sitinella Park. That's where I honed my skills. Football, we actually could turn on lights in there. I vividly remember the um, beginnings of Inglewood families being started in Sitinella Park mm -hmm. by some of the mm -hmm. People that, you know, were, I, I was younger at the time, but I remember them meeting there, talking, establishing their roots. So um, it necessarily did not transfer over to violence, but, you know, initially the street gangs were there to. Sectioning off, I'll just say that, not violence, sectioning off of territorial-wise, whatever, you yeah, know. Because, man, 1972, you know, especially with Sentinel Park, you still got the Crips that was coming up there every Sunday when they started to form. Absolutely. And then, you know, you got, like like you were saying, you know, you got the Inglewood families, and they're there during the week, and then just, so, and you guys is there. So you're, 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 you're getting the, the, the bird's eye view. Yeah. But, you know, I was not really exposed to it. But you would just see it. I, I, you know, you would see it. I know what that is. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, again, I'm going to reiterate my focus on it, my family made sure that I was entrenched with sports. sports yeah. I mean, just about every day there was something for me to do because, I, like I said, I played football, baseball, and basketball. So there was either practice, training, you know, after school. Back then, uh, we would catch the bus to, to practice. Um, so I was entrenched with it on a daily basis. So, you know, it, you only just got, man, you, besides being Mr. Perfect, you only got one smite. <laughs> On the on the record, you know you know what that is, right? What is that? You, man, you went to Inglewood, man. <laughs> <laughs> you knew that was coming. Went uh, to Inglewood, man. It's Sentinel, huh? Yeah. Hey, man, it's Sentinel, man. <laughs> well, let, let let me make a correction. Nah. No, no one's perfect, and I appreciate nah. the accolades <laughs> and the adulation. Um, you know, no one's perfect. Um, 
But what I did try to accomplish, you know, and I know we're going to talk about that a little later, was just to, to be a tangible, concrete role model for you guys, you know, um, just dealing with you on a daily basis. So and and um, incorporating some of my values and ethics that I was raised upon and, and sharing that with you guys. But, you know, I, I'm far, not, you know, my religious beliefs, I'm far from perfect, but I try to. Um, hone those skills on a day-to-day -day basis. So, man, don't be humble. Got to be what humble. You, man, don't be humble. Got to be world. humble, Mr. Banks. Got to be humble, sir. So, man, what was you like on that football field, man? Keep it, keep it real, Mr. J. This, this is your chance. This, this is your chance to be Al Bundy, man, and tell them glory. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me let me start off. My first love was basketball. You know, that was my first love. I thought I was going to be 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six. but I played, like I said, football, baseball, basketball, played football at an early age. I was pretty decent as a youth football player. You know, back then, there was no flag football. I started playing tackle football at seven, eight years old, mm -hmm. full pads at Sitinella Park, nice. getting it in um, all day. Uh, I, I would, you know, I would say I was, uh, I was pretty average. I'm not going to, again, I'm going to remain humble. That transcended into high school at Inglewood High School. Uh, I was a decent running back. Um, I think my senior year, I rushed for almost 2,000 yards. Mm. Uh, I was a decent <laughs> running back. <laughs> uh, I had a few offers, University of Utah, Oregon State, uh, University of Hawaii. My biggest goal, I Damn, think. University of Hawaii, they don't really come in. For the brothers. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. real. Yeah. So you lightweight was hogging. Well, they... At that time, they recruited Southern California hard. Okay. Yeah, they recruited Southern California hard. But just like many other um, football players and basketball players, my, my main aspiration was to play for one of the local universities. I, I saw myself being a, a football player at USC. USC. I emulated Marcus Trojan, Allen, yeah. the Trojans, baby. Yeah, yeah. I emulated Marcus Allen growing up. That was my idol. Yeah, but it didn't happen. You know, they said that I wasn't good enough, obviously, but um, I made them pay a little bit later. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you make them pay? <laughs> um, in some games that we played, you know, we played them annually. I remember vividly uh, a receiver up in Corvallis. He called a little out pass, and, and I hit him kind of hard, and I think injured his leg. Uh, <laughs> and, and let me let – me, Clipped him. Yeah, but <laughs> – and I don't get any joy out of, you know, causing Football. or inflicting harm on someone, so I don't want anyone to think that I'm you – know, By no means. Yeah, but that was just the nature of the game. Yeah, back then, so, especially. Absolutely. And I, and I let them know. <laughs> <laughs> I let them know. Yeah, it has to be done sometime. Absolutely. Um, and – once I finished my career at, at Inglewood, I was a tailback at Inglewood, like I said. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Gaston Green. He was uh, the number one running back, went to the univer um, UCLA. He was out of Gardena High School. So he was considered like one of the best running backs in the nation. So I was always chasing him. He ended up going to UCLA. But once I got to Oregon State, I accepted that scholarship there. They switch me from a running back to a defensive back to a DB. That's what you wanted to do or you just – but you had quick feet? Or yeah, was that an easy transition for you? Very difficult. And it wasn't something that I – I had been playing running back all my life. I never – I played DB I think one time in high school. But the reason that they made that transition, number one, people fell off. They did not live up to their expectations. Uh, we had about – I want to say 24 freshmen that came in in my class. Four, four years later, only about six of us finished. So, tapping out. Yeah, tapping out. Tapping <laughs> out. So that's when they made that decision early on. Hey, we need someone on the defensive end um, in terms of playing defensive back. What do you think about making that transition? They seen your sturdiness. Well... I think that's true. Again, I'm going to remain humble. They saw something in me yeah. that I didn't see, and I, um, like most challenges, I took it on and, and yeah. ran with it. So being a defensive back, man, what did you end up doing back then, man? <laughs> you probably heard this story a, a million times, you know, in the classroom. I ended up, uh, as a sophomore, 
leading the Pac-10 in interceptions with nine, and I was second in the nation to a gentleman by the name of Benny Blades from the University of Miami. Mm -hmm. He ended up having a long um, career in the NFL with the Detroit Lions. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have a plaque at home um, on one particular All-American team that year I beat out Deion Sanders hmm. um, at the corner end. And now, no way am I comparing myself to prime yeah, time. But, them, but, but that's just what but, it is. Th now. It is what it is. Statistically, they put me on that, you right. know, with nine picks. And, and that was a very, very difficult, arduous task to get nine interceptions in, in one season and I'm not going to lie, I look at that, it's still a record to this day at You're Oregon playing State. up against some hogs, too. Hogs? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it ain't like, you know what I'm saying? Hogs. <laughs> You're playing up against some hogs. Pac-10 so. with a Pac-10, because, yeah. I man, wasn't nobody looking for Oregon State like that. No, like that. We, we weren't really as good as, you know, the current team is at Oregon, Oregon State. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if we got three or four wins in, in a season, we were fortunate. As long as y'all beat, uh, what's, what's down there, the Beavers? No, we were the Beavers. The Ducks. The Ducks. Oh, yeah, we had to beat the Ducks. Oh, you had to be a hog. Yeah, we had to beat the, that was our ride. I, I, man, to this day, man, I hope man, Oregon Eugene. State beats the Ducks. I do not like, I don't like Eugene. I don't like them Ducks. I do not like Oregon. Yeah, what, I, I have some memories, though, of some of the quarterbacks that I faced. Uh, Troy Aikman, Hall of Famer, UCLA. A lot of UCLA. parties down there. Yeah, Troy Aikman was um, the John, um, Harbaugh, who's now the coach. Jim Harbaugh, yeah. Jim Harbaugh. We played him in the big house at Michigan. I wasn't fortunate enough to get a pick off him or um, Troy Aikman. Uh, Rodney Pete, he was a – I remember Rodney yeah, Pete. Rodney yeah, Rodney was at USC. Chris Chandler was the quarterback at UW. I got a pick off him. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it was a unique experience, man. And I wouldn't trade that in. And some of the friendships that were uh, established at Oregon State, yeah. they last a lifetime. In what's, fact, what's that I was going to say with some of the alumni, man, that you uh... – um, Well, obviously, you know, you and I – um, talked about Gary Payton. He was there. Um, A.C. Green was a pillar mm. in basketball at that particular Lakers. time. Absolutely. Yeah, he, I want to say he out of the Portland area. He's yeah. from Portland. Benson, yeah. I think. Yeah. I want I okay. want to say Benson. Benson. Okay. Yeah. 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 Very solid dude. Both he and he and um, Gary. Um, but some of the my close friends that I keep in contact with today, Calvin Nicholson, um, Gerald Carr. Um, Doug Lewis. Doug is the one that I mentioned. He and and, and your relative Robert there on the L.A. Um, City Fire Department together. Yeah. He's, you know, I actually was his host. He's out of Bourbon Day when he came up to Oregon State. Um, I sh showed him around and he okay. selected Oregon State as, you know, his university Shout to pursue his to career. The Eagles. Shout out to the Verb, baby. Oh, for real. Hey, man, one week, man, one week alumni. <laughs> <laughs> one week. One week at Vermin Day? Man, listen, man. Nigga, them bounty hunter niggas, man. Them, I was like one in the first day, man. Them niggas all behind the gate. The bus coming, they all run out, jump on the bus. Bounty hunter niggas was over there beating the shit out of them niggas, man. Wow. Wow. I'm like, oh, I can't go to school. I can't I can't do it. I can't fight by myself because I... And you way out of bounds too. Way out of bounds. <laughs> yeah, you way, <laughs> way. But you know my my um my folks live on 110th and Compton Ave, right around the corner. So they knew. So I grew up on the weekends, having to squabble, just squabble. Oh yeah, that's that pretty boy nigga from Eaglewood. And them flannels and shit, <laughs> and Eddie Bauer shirts and shit. <laughs> but you know, Verbin Dave pretty much set the precedent for uh, black student athletes, man, in the late 60s, early 70s, with an athlete by the name of Raymond Lewis, man. He was deemed one of the best street basketball players hmm. in the history of, of um, Southern Cal, man. Yeah, but, they have a, a long history of athletes and scholars, man. That's why, you know, I'll, man, I, I, I'll never forget, my family was happy as fuck when I got accepted. Oh, I bet. Because I took the test, all that, man, and passed the test, and it was like, and went for a week <laughs> on the scholarship program. Oh, wow. It's so right there, boy. Man, the dumb mistakes you make in life. Well, no, everything you happens for a reason. Yeah, you just take it out of my mouth. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah, man, I should have been Dr. Banks. You are. <laughs> no, you are. You are. So what year did you graduate from uh, Oregon State? 89. 89. Came out of there in 89. Yeah. So what brought you, what brought you to uh, Morningside? All right, that's a great question. After being conditioned and, and thinking that, you know, I had the opportunity of pursuing a professional career in football, when it didn't happen, 
you know, fortunate enough to, to earn my degree. I initially wanted to be a, a police officer. Hmm. I wanted to be a, a, a federal agent. I wanted to be an FBI agent. So I interviewed actually at Oregon State. But what deterred me from that was they said, uh, and I'm not sure if it still exists to this day, you had to have a job for two years. They didn't care where it was. That was a prerequisite. You had to have worked somewhere for two years. Well, I needed to start earning money. I needed to start making money. So I, I couldn't wait. One of my close friends, Marcus Muhammad, who played high school football with me, uh, he had began a teaching career in L.A. Unified School District, actually in Watts, right, mm. right behind Bourbon Day. Mm. So he inspired me to, hey, man, you know, uh, it's a very rewarding career. Uh, I think you'll make a, a great impact on our youth. Um, so I left Portland, um, came down, and here's how things work. I went down to fill out an application at Inglewood Unified. And I saw my former principal there, uh, Dr. Larry Freeman. He played an intricate part um, in the sports program and the academics at Inglewood High. He saw me, and he expedited the um, paperwork. And literally, after my fingerprints uh, cleared, I was on campus. I started at Monroe first. Okay. Yeah, I started at Monroe with Mr. Lofton. Right, okay. For for about six months until my paperwork was processed. Rise yeah. in power to yeah. Mr. Law. Absolutely, man. absolutely. He was a great mentor for me. Okay. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That, man. So I started off at Monroe and then um, took on that position at, at Morningside. Yeah, because, you know, I remember, man, you know, coming into Monroe and being ignorant to that program, which is school with a purpose. Absolutely. You know, niggas be like, oh man, that's some retarded niggas class. You know, that's, that was our mindset. That's some right. retarded, till you end up in the class. Mm -hmm. Then you looking, this, this was the crazy part. You call them, oh, that's the retarded niggas class. But you wouldn't say that to their face. Because then you had to start looking like, hey man, why all the, everybody that's over here beating up all the kids at the school is shaking us down for our candy and our <laughs> lunch money is all in this one class. But it was Mr. Laughlin. Mr. Laughlin, man, he used to be cool. Absolutely. Play basketball with us. And, but he was cool. But you, all these kids, and I'm, 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 I'm keeping it 100, some rough kids. Yeah, yeah. Now, was, was but, nothing, and I don't mean to cut you up. No, no, go. But respect was feared. Mm hmm. Mr. Laughlin. Yeah. I'm like, why y'all tripping me? Bell ring. I remember those days. And I'm. this is just Monroe. So, man, man, not to jump too far, but. You know, I just wanted, man, you know, Mr. Laughlin was another one of those brothers, man, that was out here really working with the youth, man, you know, and again, rising power to that brother. Man, in the real. trenches. Man, for real. In the trenches. Now, I want to give a, a historical context on what you mentioned, Schools with a Purpose. That was the name of the program uh, that I was fortunate enough to be an instructor in. The program came out of a need for... Um, it was designed specifically for black males. The program was established by my current employer, Los Angeles County Office of Education. Excuse me. <coughs> At that particular time, it was a need to address um, some of the concerns as to why African American men, young men, were failing in the educational system. It wasn't because of the students, the system as it was constructed at that particular time was failing our student population. So the, the county put these programs in predominantly black neighborhoods on school campuses. The model was it was a school within a school. So it was a classroom that was designed for black males where it was self-contained, you know, what was the criteria for the youth that came into these programs? Great question. That, that's a great question. There was no criteria. It was for any and all black males that 
the admin felt needed that empowerment of being in um, having a day to day um, um, contact with the, with a positive black male. Camaraderie. Of Absolutely. With, the, with your brother, you know what I mean. With Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but that that's a great question. The 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 prerequisites were there weren't any. Let, let's try to educate as many of them as we can. Well, how did it get the stigma of oh them as them retarded kids? Because just like Mr. Banks said, I had this when I went to school. The same thing, like you know, they go to the, to the uh, them bungalows over there. You know, they retard. How did this get? How did it get that stigma? The program. Anytime you have people of color in one particular uh, gathering, and it's you know more than three or four, it always receives a negative connotation. E e even today, if you see three or four uh, black people, yeah, it, it's a game. So we, we always get those negative labels when in fact, these young men were the smartest ones on campus. They just needed someone to relate to them. And uh, you and I spoke about this um, yesterday. And there's a term that is prevalent in education today. It's called culturally responsive teaching. What does that mean? Culturally responsive teaching means that you incorporate one's culture into the things that they're learning in school. Right. But you can't be culturally responsible, um, responsive if you're not from their culture. So, yeah, it, um, they personally recruited in all of these programs. It was in Inglewood, Linwood, Compton, Pasadena. Every teacher in those programs were black males. Yeah. That's so to, to, to answer your question, again, a stigma is always placed on us, even if it's positive. But the young men who were in those four walls, in between those four walls, they they didn't feel that way. Right. They knew that they were uh, future kings and entrepreneurs and right. and businessmen and firefighters and lawyers. All kind of yeah. Yes, sir. Career, yeah. So that's what they man. That's what you graduated out. You just never knew. That's what was in you guys. You guys graduated. I I did nothing. I I just happened to be. And and timing is every everything. Whether it's in football, um, a marriage, a relationship. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. So what what year would you say that they started bringing in the Hispanic students or did it start like that from the beginning? It it was from it was from the inception. Now we have to look at it from a legal perspective. We could not exclude anyone. So obviously if there were Hispanic young men that were facing similar challenges, they were um, offered the same services as well. Gotcha. Yeah. So by you being a black man, what was the challenge in trying to relate to the Hispanic students? Because you know what you know what a lot of people don't know. Because like I said, a lot of people m may not be from the LA area, mm -hmm. so they don't understand. You know, they don't understand. You know the real culture differences that it comes with you being a black teacher. And now he goes, some kids is from a whole nother different culture, but we have different race relations going on in the streets in LA. Absolutely. So here's what I relied on you guys to build that bridge and create a barrier that allowed me to relate to them. So I, I used you guys' advice, um, you know, the information that you provided me and um, just built that rapport with them. Obviously, it was a little more challenging, but you know, I did my research, um, did some homework in terms of, you know, obviously the foods that they ate, how they dressed, um, you know, some of the um, um, holidays that they celebrated, things of that nature. So you had to kind of tie yourself into that. Did and I would, you know, talk to some of the uh, Latino students as well to yeah. allow them to educate me about you know their cultural experiences to make sure that they were not excluded from the process and 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 because I, I say that you know and i bring out that point i'm glad you 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 hit some of those points because i don't think people really understand 
the culture differences and just in the respect that you garnered from us black students and from the Hispanic. Because the Hispanic students was just, hey, Mr. J coming. Yeah. That was just everybody, Mr. J, everybody, Mr. J coming, you know, and, and it's crazy because if you look at it now, it's the same mindset of when people are sitting in jail. Mm. Hey, the guards is coming. Hey, put that away. Hey, put that away. But you but, but you was giving that you was giving it to us from a whole nother perspective that, you know, hey shit, I don't wanna go to jail. I know you I know what's going on. I know I ain't never had pulled your hands out. Bunny ears. <laughs> You know, and these are just, hey, I'm just saying things that we come in, somebody smell like weed. Oh, you was getting on them like that? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Different, Absolutely. Man, this was a, see, hey, I, this is a different culture. I knew, and we had youngsters, yeah. these real youngsters, that I used to sit around and be like, why are you motherfucking smoking Newports? Niggas, <laughs> 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 niggas, 14, like a, man, I'm talking about. and shit. <laughs> full blown. But, but, hey, hey, Rob gonna be, yeah, Rob. You know, we used to call Rob Pack a day. What? Rob used to smoke a pack of Newports every day. Wow. And wow. you, you, that's why I said when in regards to my family, Mr. J stopped that. Mr. J stopped. We really called him Packard. They Rob used to, you, you, man, you, and I'm just using, that's just one student. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm looking from the outside looking in. Rob used to have a 40 every night. He throw it up under the bed. Grandma go to clean up the room. It's like 80, 40 bottles up under the <laughs> It's hella packs and fucking Newports. Wow. All up under the thing. He get into your program. Hey, gang, he was gang banging. He was, man, I like, hey, one semester, this fool come out to me, I think I'm going to be a fireman. I'm like, what? I'm like, what What program? How, what made you? Uh, and he was just tough. Man, Mr. J, everybody, Mr. J, Mr. J, Mr. J. Homies and men, niggas from Crenshaw Mafia's on the bottom. Hey, uh, hey, y'all better run. Mr. J was just through here. Wow. Uh, so it, it. It's a lot. We're going to touch into some of those stories, man, but we're going to go back, man, not to go off point or anything like that, but I was just, man, you know, it. It you was like, again, you was like God in that Inglewood, in that East Inglewood area. Everybody knew about Mr. J. Nobody wanted to be a Mr. If you thought you was a badass, oh, come to Mr. J class. <laughs> oh, yeah, nah, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm cool. Well, I appreciate the accolades and uh, – Three things that we touched on in that class that I wanted to make sure were very important attributes were we focused on our minds, our bodies, and our soul. And what I mean by that is our mind obviously was the educational component, making sure that uh, they were introduced to a very rigorous academic foundation. Yeah. All right? And then our minds, uh, or excuse me, our bodies, we instituted uh, a physical education component where we exercise on a daily basis. Exterior. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, the classroom uh, was in close proximity to, a, to the track at Morningside High School and to the weight room. So we utilized uh, that track uh, in terms of classroom management. And what I mean by that is uh, it was a form of uh, positive reinforcement. Mm-hmm. Let, let me put it in that okay. manner. So, you know, if it was time for us to, uh, if they did not want to adhere to the educational component, then let's go out, let's step outside and release some of that. Those endorphins. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is uh, scientifically proven to, okay, get out there. Now maybe we can go back to focusing afterwards, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah. Military mindset. Yeah. You, you, you the fuck up in the class. Guess what you about to do. Guess what we got to do. Yeah, you fucking fuck Everybody got to do No, it. you're fucking up. You know what? Ritual time, Right. You made me run. You made me. He ain't been thinking about it. I've been getting my name on it. I'm getting little checks. But now, because you're acting up, oh, you're going to be an angel come tomorrow. Because <laughs> if not, I'm going to beat the brakes off you. I mean, you ain't about to have me out here. So it was a, like a military mindset. Your brother was going to make sure you finished. Your brother was going to make sure you knocked out them push-ups. He, you motivated, Mr. J. Man, come on. You were teaching at a time when uh, 
I'm assuming when Judge Dorn was throwing a lot of kids and was was doing them dirty, right? Absolutely. Ju judge Dorn was a prominent uh, judge in the community at that mm -hmm. time. And being that some of the students within the program were on probation and they would have to go see Judge Dorn, uh, I remember his name uh, clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that name was very prominent and a lot of students feared uh, Judge Dorn having to go and face him in court for some of, you know, yeah. their situations that they encountered in the community. It's, you know, I got mixed emotions over Judge Dorn. Yeah. I didn't know him personally, but I just, you know. I know you've seen that name. Absolutely. Yeah, come I across why I just said that. You know, man, um, I knew some brothers. They was doing some, uh, man, you know, this when he became the mayor. He was notorious for But nah, I'm going to tell you the flip side. They was, man, they was some brothers that was getting harassed by the police. They pulled, you remember the old school? You get harassed, you just pull in the driveway, jump out real quick, mm -hmm. act like it's your house, ain't your house. <laughs> but it's like, fuck it, we here now? They did that. Guess who came outside? Mm. Judge Dorn. Wow. They pulled into Judge Dorn's driveway. Guess what Judge Dorn did? Looked at him. Said, these police is messing with y'all, huh? Went and talked to the police. Sent the police on his way. Wow, he must have had to change your heart or something. When the fact of change, I look at it, that's why I said, I'm able to look at it. I'm older now. Okay. When I was younger, okay, it's sort of like, I don't, I'm not a fan of Kamala Harris. But it took a nigga that did 15 years to say, hey, bro, I didn't volunteer to go see her. I didn't, she didn't come looking for me. I, I was doing what I was doing. I got caught up. So you can't be mad that she treated me the way that she got to handle business. So in certain ways, it's kind of how I look at the door. So in certain ways, you know you had no business doing something. I can look at it older now, not a maybe younger. I'm like, man, I ain't trying to see Judge Dorn. You had Judge Moore at Kenyon. Yeah, but he was dealing with, with kids. He was dealing with youth. Mm -hmm. He was dealing with a lot of kids that might have not needed incarceration. Like, I, I know I'm just saying. No, no, I'm here. Good kids that uh, maybe if they had had a, a teacher like you, it could have easily turned them around and, and and he gave them max and turned them into monsters. You know what I'm saying? Coming Facts. out that way. It, it's, 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 you know, it's like you can fault. You can fault the judicial system in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, it's broken. But at some time, you know, you're either going to be a product of your environment or you're going to be a product of your choices. And I hate to say it like that because the environment is already fucked up. But, nigga, my mama smoked blow. <laughs> my dad wasn't around. I knew the difference on the kids. That, hey, we about to go and, and run up in this house. Hmm. Do I want to go to jail or do I want to stay on the streets? And you know, it's always the choice. I always had a choice. I could, I could do right or I can do wrong. I, I had the choice that I can listen to Mr. J. Some kids don't know they have a choice though. You know what I'm saying? And, and some don't, and you in agreeing. A lot of time, I'm gonna keep it real, a lot of the worst you kids. You know, when there's lights, camera, and action, and, you're, and especially it's hard enough when you're an adult, let alone a kid, you know, in they the, don't. In the Inglewood area, I'm gonna be real with you, in the Inglewood area, just around the, the, the Inglewood families, around that Warren Lane area. A lot of the niggas that was gangbanging going to jail came from two parent homes. A lot of the choices niggas was doing, nigga, mama work, nigga, daddy work, they get everything they want. Nigga, I, I, nigga, I don't know what it, nigga, I know Pro Wings. I know, man, XJ 1300s. I got, I didn't get my first pair of Nikes till I was in the fifth grade. So it's like, yeah, you remember when you coming from shit, you looking at, you're really look, you're looking at all of it. Like, man, I grew up, I grew up in Inglewood, but I also grew up in South Central. So a lot of different spots in South Central. I grew up 58th in Denver. I grew up over there. 110th, 110th in uh, Avalon. I grew up over there. So I'm seeing. So when I got to Inglewood, I'm like, whoa, this is nice. This is beautiful. Then I seen the camaraderie with a lot of the OGs. There was a lot of Compton OGs at the, that lived in Inglewood at the time. You had your, your Inglewood blood, but you had a lot of Compton OGs. But they treated us with love. They showed us love. They wasn't like, my grandmother come out there and cursed them out. Stop selling all that goddamn dope in front of my motherfucking house. <laughs> yes, Miss Hawkins. And they moved down the street. But it was nothing. But we come out, man. Somebody messing with us. We was part of the neighborhood. Hey, man, we gonna fuck you up. So in a lot of time, yeah, Dorn, yeah, he was fucked up. I can't, I can't. He was fucked up because he was locking up black folks. He was fucked up because he was locking up Latinos. But if, if, if they would have put him in Torrance or if they would have put him in Redondo Beach, 
that's the question. Would he have been still locking up kids when them kids was coming in there doing some of the same crimes, but just getting slaps on the wrist? I think the answer to that question is no. You don't think so? I don't think he would have locked them up because those parents um, would have put pressure on him and would have would have gotten certain resources not saying that our parents couldn't but that's sometimes why they take advantage of us in certain situations because in many instances they don't feel that we know the proper way to respond or how to rebuke some of those particular uh, scenarios that you just described hmm. that's an important uh, important role showing up to these city council meetings, showing up, getting familiar with legislation that's getting passed and, you know, things of that nature. You know, people of color do kind of lack in that area, you know. Absolutely. That's, the, that's true. How, how do you think the style of teaching now, what do you feel about the style of teaching now versus the 90s? Mid-90s, late 90s? Oh, it's definitely has, has changed. <laughs> um, <laughs> The pendulum has swung from, um, you know, teachers and, and admin and staff having uh, certain rights, and now the students and parents have all the rights. Uh, and, and it's nothing wrong with that, but it needs to be a balance in terms of creating a, a safe environment. Uh, in you stand the, the student and the parents wants is, is kind of not letting the teacher be able to teach and have free range of uh, how they're teaching in, in the classroom? Not more so uh, of um, the curriculum, but in terms of the discipline and the classroom management, which is definitely important because if you don't have control of your class, obviously you cannot uh, conduct any form of uh, educational process within those four walls. It's, Definitely. Yeah. What What would you say, you know, in the question, you know, um, opinion-based, you know, what would you say is the pushback now? Because, uh, you know, as we see in these videos, you know, we see extreme amounts of disrespect taken towards teachers. Like, I, I never thought I'd see male dudes big as my size running up on female teachers and just talking to them anyway or just male teachers in, in period and then it's like well you guys can't defend yourself that's coming from the the politicians and the bureaucrats that are running the schools that are not in the grassroots that are setting agendas and and putting establishing laws and not listening to the people that are actually in the grassroots and thinking that some of these um, provisions that they're putting out there is in our best interest. And just like in society, you know, students know their rights and they're going to know how far they can push, you know. You can't buttons. do nothing to me. Whoa, 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 whoa. You Basically. can't do shit to me, mother. You know, yeah. that kind of thing. In California, um, they were stating that we were expelling students any, um, at a, an alarming rate. And expulsion means that technically you have been permanently removed from that school district. Once you are removed from that school district, you have to go to a specialized school. So the state said, because it's all about funding, hmm. if they're not in school, schools do not receive what is called ADA. I got expelled from the, from the district. I know to go to these little makeshift schools. Now, but you know what? I probably guarantee you, you didn't. You didn't get expelled. And here's what I mean by that. They probably told you you were expelled. Probably wasn't no paperwork. Probably nothing filed or nothing. No, and, 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 and that's the, you know, one of the, the problems. Here's what they do, especially to, to. Why would they do that? Not to keep you interrupting. Why would they do that? To, to, to say. To, to, that goes back to the point where we're talking about Judge Dorn. Um, they feel as if we don't know the legal process. I, I, I got this all the time where young African-American students came into my classroom during the intake process. Uh, I've been kicked out of this particular school. Let me see the paperwork. There is no paperwork. The principal just said that I could not return. That's illegal. Everything must 
be presented with paperwork. You must go through what's called due process. To be expelled, you have to have a hearing. You have to have um, a reason for that particular student being expelled, and they would have had to violate an ed code. So in, in those instances, the admin just said, you, you, you can't come here anymore. And that goes back to what you mentioned about in the white communities, they had paperwork. When they went through the exposure process, they hired attorneys, um, they went and fought their uh, um, hearing, they brought in lawyers, they were offered the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, but just with, in our community, it was told you can't come here, and parents took that as the truth. So, so the program School to Purpose, what made them um, remove it off of uh, Morningside Grounds? Just your opinion. Politics. Po just like when any form of hierarchy, when they, when they change or make that transition from one admin to another, just like with the president, they want to get rid of any type of programs that were established Ours. by the previous yeah. admin. Yeah, they want to do, do away with the whole Because they don't have any, uh, it's not going to benefit them. It wasn't established under their reign. Mm -hmm. So they're going to bring in something where they can show ownership and, and you know, kind of yeah. push that towards their, uh, one of their main objectives. And you know, They're rebuilding over there. They're going to try and do a lot of things. So th it was removed because of politics, even though it was it was very effective. Yeah, because that was going to be my next question. Because like, my next question was going to be, what happened to those kids that fall through the cracks like that? If that is taken up out of there, it was it was for I was fortunate after they canceled schools with a purpose, they opened a program that was called Alliance Community Day School in Inglewood um, on Arbavita, and. That school was basically there to service the Inglewood and Morningside population of students that were expelled or that were perceived as, you know, needing um, um, some more assistance. Uh, so it was just not on Morningside's campus at that particular time. But the, which is crazy to me, majority of the kids that live in Morningside, Crenshaw area, Prairie, they're, they're not going all the way to fucking Auburn Valley. They're not trying to make it up out of this. So, a lot of kids, that's what I'm saying, even though the program stayed, a lot of kids still just went on. Went on and hit the streets, did, didn't finish school or whatever then, huh? You're right. And it created so many barriers uh, because students could not make that um, jaunt from over by Morningside to that side of Inglewood. It was dangerous. Yeah, yeah. It was I, extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. So some students just did not, you know, go to school. It was unfortunate. You know what? I'm going I'm, I'm to I'm step out. I'm going to say it. And I'm gonna look, I look any one of these politicians in Inglewood or anything, anybody that, you know, lost relatives in that immediate area, in that East Inglewood area, due to 18 streets and, and the violence. black gangs violence. You wanna know why? Cause y'all took that program. Facts. They didn't have nowhere else to interact. That was the interaction. I was in Mr. J's class, I sat amongst a lot of Hispanic counterparts that in junior high, Jose, Jose and them shots out to Jose and them on Imperial, man, on the real. I was squabbling with them. Wow. We used to get, that's how I knew Jose. We used to get down with him. Okay. We used to be, I'm talking about, we'd be at Monroe getting it in. And then when I walked in to your class, that's why they knew when they looked. He started bagging on me because he already knew. He was like, man, what? I have a lot of black and brown relations to this day from your class of that mutual respect that we gained and garnered all the way, and I was telling you about it, all the way to I hit the county jail later in life mm -hmm. and ran into, again, if y'all don't know the relations between black and brown in Los Angeles, we do not get along, especially in the county jail. It's mm -hmm. politics. So I ran into... My guy, baby, I call him, I always call him Babyface Jose. And I seen him, and he in there, you know what I mean? He banging hard. He a killer now. I'm, I, but I'm still seeing Babyface. And he made it a point to just stop him. Look, hey, hey, Dominique, Johnny Gill. <laughs> you know, that's what they used to call me. They used to be like, one of the mother, I, man, Johnny Gill. Johnny Gill. He like, hey, fool, T7 love, homie. And if you don't know, when you're in them, those tanks, 
It's 30 Mexicans, 10 blacks, five of them are smokers, so they're non-void. You got maybe five dudes. We're from different hoods, different parts of the city, so we might get along, we might get together, we might not. And by him doing that, that kept the whole tension down. And they said something, hey, you mean, hey, nah, fool, I know that fool. I went to school and I grew up with him. It's T7 Love. And he was going against the politics at any time. He probably might have got DP when he got to the pen. Hey, yeah, I mean, you fucking with the blacks? But he made it a point to, and that was through you, because it would have it been all bad. We'd have been in there riding. I already know. But he made it a, a point off of what Mr. J established, what school of the purpose was. Mm. Hey, besides this game banging, besides this race relations, it's love because we went to school together. Mr. J taught us better than that. I want to say it was a fraternity. And, and, and you mentioned T7. For those people who don't know what T7 represents or symbolizes, that was our classroom number. We were in, um, that was the class number that was on, on our door, T7. Um, still famous to this particular day. Um, mm -hmm. You know, through some of uh, the people who transition through that program, such as yourself, first thing I do when, when they communicate with me is I'll send out the symbol T7 love all day. So that T7 symbolizes our classroom, the number, uh, and what we represented and what we stood for. And it was a fraternity. A fraternity, there yes, you go. Know? Yes, absolutely. Man, what's uh, some of the hardships that you faced by being a teacher and having these students and being on uh, Morningside campus and, you know, interaction with parents and students within themselves and teachers as well? That That is a, wow, that, that's a powerful question. And my, my answer to that is teaching is the easy part. Dealing with the students and parents because it comes natural. Teaching is not something that you learn from an institution. You have to be born to be a natural teacher. It has to be something innate inside of you. I cannot teach anyone how to be a teacher. Uh, it's having mutual respect, concern, love, and compassion. The difficult part of dealing with teaching comes with the politics, dealing with the adults, the admin, fighting for funds, um, getting the basic necessities, um, keeping programs intact that we know that make a huge difference on um, people's lives yeah. and not having them um, remove these programs that are successful because as I mentioned previously, it's all about self um, gratification from, from a um, politicians are an admin perspective. So that is the most difficult part. Of, it, it's like corporate America. Um, it's very similar. Yeah, so many politics. Yeah, and it, it's heavy at the top in terms of the management positions, and they always want to cut the bare minimum of the people that are in the grassroots that are dealing with, you know, lives. And I, I'm going I'm to be, be honest. My 30 years in, in education, and, and from my perspective, students are used as pawns mm -hmm. by, by politicians and by, you know, some admin. I'm not saying in all instances, but, you know, they'll say one thing uh, uh, on Saturday and then on Monday their actions show something totally different. Yeah. We're going to use a school fund to get up, put big Megatrons up, mm -hmm. you know, on all four, four, four sides of Inglewood. You, you know what I'm talking about. You just, Absolutely. Like, dude, come on, man. A -a Absolutely. What are you talking about, down Manchester? Manchester, uh, uh, with well, not our provider, but I'm, let's, by the airport. Let's, like, talk, come on. let's talk about it, all right? Because, you know, I like to, you know, even though I live in Seattle, I still like to keep up with what's going on, man. You know what I'm saying? Back home. Let's talk about how the fuck Morningside has a gas leak where they got to close the school for four weeks, but you got two billion dollar stadiums less than, we might as well say, a quarter of a mile. But, you know, Morningside went shut down four weeks. They got a heard gas leak. They had to go on straight on, on, on online iPads passes. and time. Online. Excuse me. And have you rolled past Morningside? It still looked like the same. Now, it looked like a, a really a jail now. Yes. With just defenses and uh, it just looked like a, a jail. You would never think it's a high school. 
And I'm just sitting back and I'm wrong. I said, well, shit. Because Inglewood always looked at that. It, it always looked at night. It was always pre- presented, man, presented in a nice light. You know, and I used to think just because it was Paul Pierce, maybe because Paul Pierce went there and shit. They've always treated Morningside as like the stepchild because Inglewood is mm-hmm. very close in proximity to City Hall, to all the bureaucrats that's literally across the street. You know, Morningside was always on the other side of, of, of Inglewood, and it always had a negative um connotation when you mentioned Morningside, yep. at, at least when I was growing up. And, and even yeah. as a teacher. I didn't want to go there when I came. Nobody did. I was like, fuck, man. Technically, <laughs> growing up, where I lived, I was supposed did. to go to Monroe and Morningside. But my parents were like, no, you're going to go to Inglewood. I, I actually lived closer to Inglewood, but the boundaries, I was supposed to go to Morningside. Hmm. Yeah. Morningside's a weird, it, it was always weird to me. It services a, a suburban area of Inglewood when you go into, man, you know, just in, from a real estate standpoint, when you go in them abs, them houses was always expensive. But it was like, what the fuck is going on with this school? What's going to be interesting here in the very near future, Inglewood now, because of that stadium, is going through gentrification. So now it's the, the ethnic makeup is changing. And the people that are coming in, they're going to want their school system to support, you know, what they're investing in terms of real estate. So I want to see what happens here in the next five to six years. It's going to go back. That's I, that's how I look at it. I always look at things. At, it, it's 360. Absolutely. You History told us, repeats itself. 72, you were the first man, second black family in Inglewood. I, in I don't area. think they're going to send their kids in Inglewood schools for Crazy. the most part. Crazy. Th- that could be true. However. You got Westchester. You West gotta, crazy. But Westchester is not the Westchester. Chester used to be when we were. No. No. No, it's not. No? No. Oh, they didn't switch sides and went back to Inglewood. Well. Because for a minute, they left everybody abandoned absolutely. Inglewood. Absolutely. They, they didn't want to be associated. Now they bring in the Inglewood back into the South Bay. Now, you know, they want to bring. At first, they didn't want to claim Inglewood in the South Bay, really. True. Well, now, you, know, you know who always used to believe in, um, in Inglewood? Man, I, his name, I just dropped it, forgot his name. Um, owner of the Lakers. Jerry Buss? Jerry Buss, Dr. Jerry Buss. You know, he used to hang around Century. Oh, wow. Like, man, you know, I don't know how I know that, but I know that. Like, okay. I see him come. He used to really hang. He, I don't know what it was about Inglewood. He used to love Inglewood. You know what I'm saying? He, Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't, man, you know, but it's, it's going to be, because, like, what are the taxes looking like right now over there in that area? I, I'm not sure. Sh- Privy to that because I live, you know, um, I, I live about 13 miles east of Inglewood. But from what I hear, you know, taxes have increased drastically, and I would assume it probably has something to do with that stadium, you know, you know that they put there. You know, I have relatives that still live in Inglewood. My in-laws live there, and you know, they're complaining about, you know, the high taxes and things of that nature. They've increased since they put that stadium. Yeah, there. they made all that. Uh... 99, they changed it to where the Kareem Abdul Jabbar Road. I mean, when that Derby Park had all the woods, remember, it used to be woods and Getty That's Field. That's where when I used to go that. camping, there's a Boy yeah. Scout back there. All the woods, there's a little Boy Scout bats thing, and coyotes. Derby Park right there. Yeah, yeah. That was a camp. That was a Boy Scouts of America. Little I remember camp that. Yeah. I used to go camping back there. Man, we like, man, we going camping. I'm like, yeah. Oh, shit, man. We're going we to Derby Park. Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> always going camping. But Inglewood has so much potential, man. I mean, it's in close proximity to downtown, to the beach. You're mm-hmm. an hour away from the mountains. You can go snowing. Doing, I mean, I mean, it's a perfect location. So, as you mentioned, it's starting to rotate now again. More people are trying to move in and trying to get that property. It's it's raised, you know, the value of the property there. And that's why I think it's going to be, they're going to push for a reform in those schools because they're paying so much to live there. They're going to want their children to go to that school. It's going to be difficult for them to send them out to private schools or, Mm -hmm. you know, other forms of um, formidable uh, Education, educational yeah. processes, yeah. Yeah, I really think it's going to turn. You know, man. You know what, though, Mr. J, we're part of history. Absolutely. We And and this would nobody know, but you'll remember. 1996, man, there's a rookie signed to the Lakers. Guess what school we come to? Mm-hmm. I remember that. I remember we that. We pull us in the auditorium, man. It's, hey, it's Kobe Bryant. Kobe being Bryant in his sweats. I remember that. Come and talking to us, man. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Hey, 
you y'all y'all was janky at Morningside, man. Y'all had some <laughs> man. Y'all had some out of some some auditorium. The whole school was there. We weren't there. We, we <laughs> find out at lunch. Huh. We come out at lunch. I ain't where everybody out. The auditorium, man. They open up. Everybody coming out. Oh. Oh, y'all went to oh, yeah. Kobe Bean Bryant was that man. Side. We I went to that, that one though. Yeah, yeah. yeah man. Absolutely. Eldon Campbell was up there because everybody was sad. We was like, oh, the big guy for the Lakers. We yeah. thinking Shaq about to come out, man. Eldon <laughs> Campbell come on, get out, man. Well, what are some of your fond memories of, of T Seven and and the program? Oh man, manhood. I learned to be a man. I learned to be accountable. I learned to, I'm going to be real with you. I learned. A, everybody does not learn the same, especially black children. The way that you taught me, you looked at me. You gave me the kind, it wasn't a fact. You didn't have to sit. You gave me the confidence. You looked at me. You gave, You put the confidence in me that I had negated from because I already had gave up. I gave up on school. I wasn't thinking about school. Like I was I was dealing with my own problems. I ain't got time for school, man. Fuck school. I only go here because I gotta go here. I don't I don't wanna be here. And you just looked at me, you was like, man, you know the information. You said, oh shit. Hey, hey, excuse, yeah, yeah. He used to curse back in the thing. We needed it. We was cursing, <laughs> he could curse. You said, shit, you dropped all the books. Guess what I didn't have going to school? Books. I was photo, we got a little package that was photo. So, fuck this thing. Mr. J gave me books, told me to read them. I'm looking at the books. He said, hey, I'm gonna give you a test on Friday. You better not get none wrong. You got the book. I was more worried about not letting Mr. J down. But not knowing he already had put a cold little psychological game on me that I'm learning because I'm, I can't get nothing wrong. Mr. J told me not to get nothing wrong on the test. And that was the impression that he had on a lot he of He already us. entered the psyche. Man, he, 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 yeah. man he, 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 he told me I could conquer the world. Best book he ever gave me, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Changed my whole life. Changed my whole perception. Gave me the black consciousness I have now. Because I wasn't... I didn't care. You didn't have to go to jail to read it either. Absolutely, man. Listen, man. <laughs> like every other nigga. Yeah. Come on, man. I, like I said, <laughs> I, I read the, hey, that's the whole thing. Yeah. I read the book before a lot of them got to, and now yeah, nigga yeah, come yeah. over there, man, hey, what book y'all read? Oh, man, how about you? I'm thinking, I think I read that back in high school. <laughs> what teacher gave that to me? You didn't read that back? And then you didn't read that back in high school? Nah, we read Romeo and Juliet. Like, damn, shit, I read that bullshit too. That shit was garbage. I couldn't even relate. Like, how do we, we talk in old English? Manhood. I remember, man, being across Hispanics, blacks that I thought was so hard, that was just so gangsterism. And they was kids that liked to do the same things I like to do. And we lost a lot of them, man. That's. I'm going to ask you, let me interrupt you. Nah. I'm going to ask you a question. And this kind of. It's a double side, kind of messed up. But have you ever dealt with any kids through your career and you'd be like, I don't know about this one. Like this one might not, can't be reached. He might be, he might be a little bit too far gone, you know? Or he or she. Well, I never give up on anyone. However, this is one of my uh, favorite cliches. I try to instill hope in them by giving them an example of a previous student that I had who was dealing with similar problems that, it, that they encountered. So, for example, I, I would say, I've seen you before mm -hmm. in, in, in the um, presence of another student who in, was dealing with similar traumatic um, episodes that you're going through. But don't give up. Keep pushing. Uh, as a person who grew up and lived in England, I, I could kind of tell if someone was probably going to encounter some type of um, problems in the future. Yeah, you know, j just by their mentality, how they talk, how they walk, um, um, and what I mean by that, they weren't willing to change. They, they were rigid, and they were not 
accepting what it was that I had to offer them. One of the great attributes of, uh, about Dominique and some of his um, um, classmates, they, they, they received it. They were willing participants. Mm -hmm. They not, may not have always agreed with it, but they knew somewhere, they, they, they couldn't see it at that particular time. They knew somehow, some way, that it was gonna benefit them. Right. It was just a matter of that light bulb and switch turning on. They knew the truth when they heard it. Absolutely. And at, you know, it may take six months, one year, five years. Sometimes that switch never turned on. Um, but I, I could have predicted just by the behaviors that they were demonstrating, I, I could have wrote myself a note, this person is going to be successful in 10 years. This person is going to do this in eight years. Mm -hmm. This person may, you know, face a lot of negativity down the road or encounter some serious issues. I, I yes. could have I could have predicted that. Might be some turbulence for this one. No, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. But um, I didn't give up on them. You know, um, I would give them the same advice that I would give all of, all, of, all of them, just persevere, push through it, yeah. do what you can, despite the obstacles, despite, despite the challenges, you know, keep, keep fighting that good fight. What do you feel, how do you feel about this new era of depression among the youth and among, you know, these disorders, these, you know, like, is, I'm nowhere, no doctor, no psychiatrist, but it's like, my peers and not even my peers, but just other people I talked to age bracket wise, it wasn't this mass depression, mass, you, 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 you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think, and again, I'm not a, a medical professional, but if I had to uh, point out as to one of the contributors to that, I would think it has something to do with COVID, you know, going through that uh, pandemic. Um, students not being allowed to actually go to school, to interact with other children, being on lockdown. Uh, that, that, you know, we're di still dealing with that mm -hmm. with, with some of the uh, students. You know, they're, they're instituting a lot of counseling, yeah. uh, um, social workers that are coming in to deal with that and, you know, talk to them on a daily basis. And again, I'm not a medical professional, but I would think, and I'm pretty sure that there are some studies out there that would probably say that, you know, COVID probably did have something yeah. um, to do with that. And, and, and being a teacher and, you know, raising us young men, how did that help with raising your children? Oh man, it, it helped significantly because what it taught me was that each person has their own personality and it's not a cookie cutter to, in dealing with uh, everyone. You have to mold and shape different personalities based on their interests, what they like, what do they want to do? So I treated you differently than I treated Rob, than I treated Donnell, than I treated Jose. So it taught me valuable information in terms of raising my own children. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you guys were sort of, you know, uh, practice for me in terms of, uh, you know, applying some of those skills mm -hmm. to my own um, um, three young men. But it was similar. At, at times it was similar. Um, um, fight back in terms of some of the things that my own children, my dad, you too hard, or dad, oh my goodness. But that was when they were younger. Yeah. You know, they, they, they see they, but, they see it now. Similarly to, you know, how you guys yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. um, come back and, and talk to me. In terms, they didn't see it then, but they definitely we'll see, see it now. now. Well, the, the, the one thing that I can say, you know, all the way back then, where I knew to, to believe in what you was trying to sell us, as we had the twins, you know what I mean? Little Snugs and them, Calvin and Kelly. Oh, right, right. And when they, you know, they came in, I want to say from the, I want to say they would came in from the Y. And what was crazy about them is they was two twin brothers. But they, Kelvin, you know, he would end up getting locked up. 
You know what I'm saying? He ended up getting locked up maybe about a week later. And it was Kelly. And I watched you mold and change Kelly the next day. He playing on the basketball team with us. He was he he was a like a he was a kid. Not a, a teenager. He got to live his childhood. He got to be a teen. Like it, yeah, it's crazy because yeah, yeah. you you it, it, from a from a child standpoint, you looking at all these dudes and they come they're coming in with this persona, and then after a little bit, that persona turns. Away at they, they smile it. They they want to learn. Mm -hmm. They 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 want to be just smile. They want to joke with. Because at first I didn't like Kelly. I couldn't stand Kelly with acting with all this hard. Oh man, you know on Inglewood families. I don't know, on families. Mm -hmm. That nigga shut up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And 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 it was like being a Mr. J. That's why I say they would come through. That sort of team mentality, but that military mentality. Man, what you talking? Nigga ain't trying to hear that. You see what Mr. J talking about? Shut up. We ain't trying to hear that. But, and they would change. It's like, oh, I'm going to have to change. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to be. Yeah, either believe in a program, man, or get the fuck on, or we going to beat the shit out of you every day. You're bringing up, man, you're eliciting a lot of um, things in my mind, and it's Ironic that you brought him up. I ran into him at Vaughn's in Inglewood. They had moved me to a site on La Brea. I'm at Vaughn's during my lunchtime. This was probably about four years ago. He approached me. I recognized him, but I could not place. You and, and other individuals, I'll never forget. I knew that he was a former student, mm -hmm. and, and he gave me that testimony. I got a picture of him on my phone. I, I had forgot all about, you know, I, I come across so many students. Students, yeah. But he wanted to thank me for giving him the opportunity. You know, I had forgot all about him, but it's, the irony is you brought, brought him up. I have a picture of him on my phone, man. And I forgot he had a twin brother. He yeah. reminded me of that. That's dumb. Man, you know, yeah. right, man, you know, rise in power, you know, his brother ended up dying and stuff. Oh, I I but, know you know, from that, I, I'm here to tell you, because if he told you, you know, we, we, you know, we grew up, but you running into cats, you changed him. Mm. So when he was telling you, man, thank you for being in there, you changed. I watched, I'm looking at two twins. Two brothers, one that believed in the program, the other one that went this way, and you see them again, you see which the direction they went. And, and I want to reiterate this. I changed no one. I was just given the opportunity to present you and other students with a platform to display your talents and to hone your skills and to receive a quality education mm -hmm. um, by someone who truly embraced that challenge. And I say this all the time. When a child walks into any classroom, it takes about 10 seconds for them to realize if that person who's leading that classroom generally cares for them or not. And, and they're going to feel that. Mm -hmm. And then once that bond has been created, it's inseparable. Because I know at that time that um, your mind is like a sponge, and you're gonna I can uh, um, help you, assist, and, and give you as much positive information mm -hmm. uh, to go inside your, your your skull that you're willing to accept. So that's 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 the challenge right there. I got a man, you know, and not to negate, man, but you know. We was talking about it last night, and I want you to kind of touch on just to kind of get an understanding. So yearly, how many students would you say that you would have in a class? Yearly? Starting no. starting back from uh, 92, before you before you moved on to uh, Arbor Vida, like yearly, how many students would you have? I would probably say, if I had to guess, between maybe 20 to no, 25 to about 40 per year. Now, that, that's on a low. Uh, I can't, I'm going to be honest, I can't recall the process, the turnover, you know, but generally when, when the young people were introduced to that program, they stayed in there the whole year. And then the next year we would assess it to see if they're going to mainstream, go out to the, so I would probably say about 40 or 50. Now, on another note, I, I'm not sure where you're leading. In between the time that I was at Morningside from um, 1992 to about 98, there were about 
um, 60 students uh, who unfortunately, you know, met their demise from one way or the other, whether it was gang violence, drug overdose. Yeah. So you say from 92 to 98? 98. 98. It was about 60 students, man. That Now, that was traumatizing to me. Uh, I stopped attending funerals. Um, I, and still to this day, in my garage, I have a, a stack of those obituaries from, you know, the students, you know, that I lost, man. It was, it was unfortunate. But it... That was that was difficult for me. I, I, I got to tell you that that was a very very um, dark time in my professional career as a teacher, um, going through you know. I bet. So, yeah, that, that, that establishing was tough. all these relationships with these oh, kids and man. like ah oh, man. You know, we you and I went through some of those names. You know, some of them I I had you know forgot I hadn't looked at my um, uh, those obituaries, but man, that that was very tough. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Mr. Jack can say, man, you know, with an open heart to some of those individuals that passed, you was the best thing ever happened to them. And we would we would talk about like that was the common ground, you know, of being around some of them brothers I lost. It's like we get to we see each other, man, are oh, you remember Mr. J? Remember Mr. J? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people I never had your class, but everybody in the school was man. And you know, man, it ain't it ain't it, it's tears of joy because, like, again, we get to I get to I get to tell you that, like, hey, these brothers that did you was the best thing, cause that was the common ground that when we seen each other, hey, man, remember when Mr. J did? Remember when Mr. J? Remember when Mr. J show up at your house, make that phone call? Remember Mr. J tell you get your ass up? It's time to go to school. You got to be a man. Mm -hmm. If you're sick, if you're not feeling good, ain't no excuses in life. You yeah. still got to get the job done. And these were all these. It 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 stayed with us. And, I, you know, I went to some of these funerals and I looked at their mothers and, you know, I, I looked at, you know, their families. And. That they're looking at their baby, but the fact that they knew. You was my son's friend, and you was in Mr. J's class. You know, I, I ran into some people who was like, Nick, is that's that you? fraternity. Yeah, what well, we yeah. mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's They're like, fraternity. man, Nick, is that you? Like, wow, I haven't, you know. And shouts out to everybody, man, that was in the program and youngsters that didn't make it. Absolutely, because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a reality, but it's a blessing. So I'm, I'm here to tell you, though, mm. Mr. J, like, hey. The best times, man. And you know what? Th this is very humbling to me. And your testimony is what you, you just gave me five more years possibly to teach. Mm. Your testimony is what motivates me. Um, just you reaching out and contacting me. All it, you know, one student just telling me that they learned something from that program motivates me. Uh, it's not the paycheck. It's not dealing with the, with the politics, the bureaucrats, um, uh, the chaos of the educational system. But for you to extend an invitation to have me in this platform to um, give me the opportunity to tell me what that program meant to you and your family, that's worth it's weight in gold, man. And, and, and I want to humbly say that I really, really appreciate you for extending that opportunity because um, who knows what may grow from this. Someone may watch this and um, may want to duplicate and recreate that program to help people, um, to help establish the next Dominique Banks, mm -hmm. um, the Robert mm -hmm. Hawkins, um, the other people that prospered from that. And, and, and let me... Um, also add in the fact that when I arrived here and you, you, you told me everything, you know, that you have accomplished and that you continuously are working towards on a day-to-day -day basis, but to see what you have done and embrace the community and embedded yourself in the community, 
man, I, I, I'm like a proud, proud father, uncle, grandfather, all of the um, um, male people that, you know, mm -hmm. have helped influence you. That will never go away. Huh. And j just as I shared with you um, and, and other people that participated uh, in that program, I don't look at this as an mm -hmm. honor. However, I look at this as my service to my community. And you've picked that up and taken it to a whole different level. And I, I'm going to add this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it out here. And, and no one knows what the future holds for us. But I know you have a, you know, a, a long life ahead of you. But what I ask of you and other people, if and when I do reach my demise, I want you to eulogize that. Off top, it'll be. Uh huh. Hey, I'm gonna say this. Uh, You're gonna have so many brothers that's gonna be there fighting to carry your casket. Uh, a lot mm. of people don't know. I, I, I fight for so many rights right now in terms of equity and 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 um, equal access in the educational system. People don't know the history. I'm, I'm gonna be honest. People that I work with think I'm an asshole because I'm fighting for the rights of of individuals, man. Whether you're white, black, brown, purple. But I want people to know this history. Th this is history. Th th this is history. A lot of people don't know. A lot of people think, you know, I just showed up as a teacher. They don't know what we went through, um, the process in terms of, you know, educating people. Man, that, 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 that's history. And I don't want that to ever be left unwritten or undocumented. If you've made your mark. So it's like... And when it, when we he gonna keep here, making it sound man, like it says next on, five man. years. Oh, he. I mean, let's do it. Yeah, come you, on. You you've given me you re energized me, man. Um, you know, to to hopefully you know continuously impact our youth, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be real. There's no spot without you. <laughs> there's no you. It was it was always in you. I'm I'm gonna humbly I, th I, throw, I, throw I, that. You are gonna be successful. No matter what, God just put us in this uh, opportunity to cross paths. And mm -hmm. you, you, you were going to be successful no matter what. You know, it may have taken a different route. You may have, you know, you may have done it earlier. You may have done it later. But I'm just fortunate enough um, that I was allowed and afforded the opportunity to, um, you know, be in your presence and, and, and help you with some of your dreams and aspirations, just like all the other youth that have crossed my path, man. And, and to me, that again, that's worth more than any paycheck yeah, or yeah. anything from that perspective, because I know you and I know you're genuine about it. You, you, you truly, you know, mean what you say and you say what you mean. So, man, that, that, that's what it's all about. Hey, let them see that Inglewood native, man. Sweater you got on. Oh, the right here, man. man. Yeah, that that shows it all right there. There you go, Inglewood man. Inglewood native, baby, since 1972. Hey, we gonna have a time when we put drop the video, man. We gonna have Bosco with the words, like, shit. man, for real. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. Bosco gonna drop. We gonna put that tagline. Bosco be like, man, you done found another Inglewood. <laughs> We got Inglewood native, and we got Seattle native up in here, man. All mamas, man. All day and twice on Sunday. Man. Yes, sir. Well, look, man, I know we've been sitting here talking you to death, man. We ain't going to hold you too much longer and everything, Mr. J and stuff, man. Man, no, nah, hold on. I got I'm still <laughs> questions for him. Yeah. You know, aside from, aside from, are we still, can we still roll? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aside from the teaching, man, you, uh, uh, you still look pretty well kept, man. What's your regiment? <laughs> I'm getting, I just had a birthday. I, I asked for personal. I just had a birthday. And I look up to, you know, you still teaching more of what you, you know. Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of our dialogue, um, mind, body, and soul. So, therefore, I've always kept 
uh, exercise regimen, you know, that tries to keep me in some type of physical condition. So every day I wake up at 5.30 a.m., I get a little cardio in, do some calisthenics, a um, little lightweight training, um, things of that nature. And um, when you gentlemen reach my age, you, you, you got to, you know, got to watch that diet. So mm. um, I, I try to, I, I'm still working on it. You know, it's work in progress, um, you know, but, you know, I, I maintain a, a serious regimen in terms of some calisthenics, some light push-ups, some cardio, similarly to what, you know, I introduced them to when they were, you know, when they were in my class. It stays classroom. with you, huh? Absolutely. I know um, Dominique mentioned it. Uh, Robert, who is related to Dominique, he's a fire captain in the city of L.A. He uh, gives great, great uh, recognition to what we labeled the ritual as building a foundation for him to pursue his career in terms of being a firefighter. And I know that you guys had um, Sonny Bleep McEwen on yeah, previously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was That's a product. Another one. He was a product. That's an up-to-date generation. And you yes, know? sir. And he said, and he and I had a conversation that the ritual um, gave him the mindset to be a professional boxer. He said that he knew that he could maintain and, and exercise on a day-to-day -day basis to you know, become and maintain that professional status as a boxer. Mm -hmm. So The mindset. Yeah, absolutely. I, so to ask your question, I incorporated it into my daily ritual, and that's been something habitually that I've done since you know, I was like seven or eight years old. Hey, Mr. J, man, I got one of your former students who just called, who calling right now. Robbie Rob. What's up, man? Man, I got, I'm good, man. We got you on camera right now, man. I got Mr. J on here, man. You know what I'm saying? What's we, up, Mr. J? What's going on, doing? Robbie Rob? Captain Hawkins, oh, how you doing, sir? Hello? Can you, can you hear me? Ah, oh, man, we, man, hey, knowing him, he done lost it. <laughs> Dropped the call, huh? Yeah, he look, he called him, look, he called him right back. Hello? Hey, sorry, I don't know what happened. Hey, look, look, just, man, you know, being, we over here filming, man, but just, you know, just a quick, man, give us a quick synopsis, man, of just, you know, what what Mr. J mean to you, man, and the things that he was able to help you with. Oh, man, you know what? It, it's, uh, it's a life-changing, life-altering, I mean, for the better, just... It everything, everything that I got, man, is just he opened. You know, he gave me an opportunity back in the day, he, and and it's not, and it was tough love too. It, it wasn't just like giving us something for free. It was teaching us to be self sufficient, teach, giving us self worth, and and that's the first time. I mean, I was taught on the level to get me ready for college and to give me an opportunity, you know what I mean? So all the stuff I learned back then and just the, the confidence, I knew I could, you know, do something with that. And then and then, not only that, look where the relationship is now. It don't stop. It's real. It's, a, it's, a, it's somebody that taught us years ago that we still talk to and look to as a mentor. So it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, man, it's a, it's a blessing. Man, st state your title, man. State, state yeah. your title, Buster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let, let so. them know, man. Let them know who who who's on the phone, man, and what it is that you do. Oh, uh, you know, I, I work. I'm a captain for the fire department, Los Angeles City Fire Department, and uh, you know, yeah, I, I've been working for the department for over 20 years, and still in the neighborhood. Working in the neighborhood, so yeah. Shout out to you, Captain Hawkins, man. It's always a pleasure to hear your voice. And and, and as I stated to Dominique, you guys um, add vigor and and um, give me energy to wake up every day to keep doing what I'm doing. Just hearing your testimony and knowing um, that you allowed me and afforded me the opportunity. Uh, to provide an, an education to you, man. So shout out to you guys, and I appreciate you know some of the hey, accolades and, and some of the things that you mentioned. But again, as I mentioned previously, you guys always had it in you. It, it was mm -hmm. just um, someone I was fortunate enough um, 
to be in that opportunity to provide you guys, you know, with with the structure and, and the educational process, man. So I'm, I'm proud of all of you young men and the men that you've grown to become. So keep pursuing all of your goals and the sky is the limit to, to, to all you guys, man. So much love and respect. Much love, Mr. J. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, pack a date, man. I'll talk right, to you later, man. man. You take care. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, Hey, yeah, man, that's me. You know, like I say, man, that's me, Mr. Captain Fire, Fire Captain Robert Hawkins, L.A. City Fire Department, former student of Mr. J, graduate of the School with a Purpose program, man. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So, man, you know, again, man, I, 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 I got to tell a quick story. I'm running the ritual one time, man. The, the track coach get the time in me. Click, <laughs> click, click. I'm running. I'm Click. He like, man, he come talk to me. Hey, man, you, you want to run track? Look at him. Hell, no, nah, I don't want to run no track. I don't even like you, right? Go back to the class. So Mr. J, he, Mr. J like, hey, look, for some, hey, for some odd reason, hey, the coach wants you to run track. I'm like, man, Mr. J, man, I ain't trying to run no track, man. He like, man, Coach Fletch walk in. He like, oh, man, yeah, Coach Tatum keep talking about you. They want you to run track. I said, man, I'm not trying to run no track. I'm not with that run. Look, my ignorant, man, I'm not with that run nigga run shit. <laughs> yeah. My ignorance. This is my ignorance and stuff. I, I'm not with that run. Mr. J, knowing, knowing me, again, knowing different things from students, he hit me with the right term to get me to run track. He said, hey, Dominique, you ever been on a track meet? I said, nah, I ain't ever been on a track meet. He said, you know, it's some of the most beautifulest women the most from every school women, yeah. at these track meets. Yeah. I said, oh, yeah, Mr. J? Oh, yeah. He like, yeah. <laughs> he said, man, go just try it, man. Try this one Try this one um, open open run or whatever. It was at Cal State Northridge. He said, just try it. If you don't mm. like it, you ain't got to run. When I tell you, I got off that bus. <laughs> yeah. I looked. He finna be running track. <laughs> oh, bro, I never, didn't lose one event that whole year. <laughs> not, not one. First. Running. Yeah. Never yeah. never ran track before. Never. I'm running against cats that's running, that's running on track teams, everything. Only thing I got is the ritual. That's all I know. I know oh, I ain't about to, because I know I got everybody in the class and Mr. J watching. And I can't make T7 look bad. Yeah, they're going to dog you. Oh, they're going to dog me. And here's where, here's where we saw that. When they would run around a track, during the ritual, he was the rabbit, man. He was out there as if he's been doing this all his life. I have no doubt that if you were to pursue uh, a career in athletics, I mean, you, you he could have possibly played in the NFL. He could have been mm. an Olympian. He had that type of talent, man. Um, yeah, you suckers, y'all heard it, man. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm keeping it 100. Uh, now, were you paid to say that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just reminiscing, and all of these visuals are coming back into play, man. I, I'm remembering him just running around that yeah. track effortlessly. Yeah, really. As tough. if. He had been doing that. Just all, moving. Oh, man, and it was, I mean, he had a stride, and the coaches loved it, man. Coach Tatum put out um, nationally recognized track stars and football players, yeah. and I, I I mean, he played. and He could have went, in my opinion, and played Division One football and been a, a, a huge success story. Uh, you know, unfortunately, man, I just, my mindset, that's the only unfortunate because – like, I was telling you the story about Coach Tatum, and I was mad, but then I look at it now, and I was like, yeah, I didn't really show that I Tatum. can. Yeah, you know, Tatum was a, but then, you know, somebody else, you know, shots out the man, you know what I'm saying, Dominique, man, you know what I'm saying, that man, our man, our brother, man, he he kept it real. He was like, he said, unfortunately, he was like, Tatum didn't know how to reach you guys as Mr. J and Fletch did. So he didn't know how to motor. He just didn't know how to motor. He was, he, it's nothing to get, like, he's helped a lot of cats, but he was extremely negative. So I, we just, our mind, we couldn't click. And maybe to some, that nigga that would, oh, yeah, you're not going to be, man, you can't be the number one. And you know that, oh, yeah, I'm going to be number I Man, I didn't care. I'm like, I don't care about you, dude. I'm, on a, I'm running track for Mr. J. I ain't doing it for you. I'm out here winning for Mr. J. I'm not out here winning. I can care less. But let, oh, me, let me put things in perspective, though. Everything happens for a reason. Huh. 
it didn't go that way because you're here touching lives and doing things that that this is your plan. No regrets. I have no the, regrets. Zero. No regrets. Th- th- this this is your plan. Um, you're giving back to the community. You've adopted a community, and and you're man. Some of the things you're share you've shared with me that you're doing, man. Those are blessings. So that was your calling. Similarly to when you know. When I first finished college, I got tired of uh, uh, answering the question as to why didn't you play professional football? At first, I was going through these long, drawn-out stories, and the bottom line, I wasn't good enough. I didn't make it. My calling was to be in a classroom and to help and give back to my community. So there's no regrets. you're exactly where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to do, giving back to your community and changing lives, man. And that's yeah. that's bigger to me than um, any sports star yeah, because one of the things that afforded me the opportunity to be a, a, a teacher was that I was tangible, concrete, someone that you could see on a day-to-day basis, unlike – you share the story, the Kobe Bryant's, the LeBron's. What are the opportunities or what are the chances of someone conversing with those people on a day-to-day basis? Hmm. The, the chances are slim. You know, Charles Barkley quoted and, and, and created this cliche, I'm not a role model, but you know what? I am. You are. You are. So you're changing lives, man. So, you know, you know I, I'm proud of that. Man, I, it's nothing but love, Mr. J. Absolutely. Nothing but love, man. And shit, man. You know, shouts out to everybody, T7 Love. We got a lot of viewers that that's from T7 that Absolutely. be watching the podcast, Shout out man. to all of you guys. So they gonna much be, love They're going to be happy to see you. Like, man, all right, how you find Mr. J? <laughs> <laughs> you got him up there, huh? Absolutely. And I'm proud to be here, man. It's a humbling experience. Yeah, man. Shouts it's out to sure. Noodles, because, boy, Noodles, yeah. boy, he pushed you so hard. That, hey, again... Shout- I'm not going to say I have favorites because as someone who's been, you know, a mentor, you never, but I'm going to put it out there. You, Noodles, and, and, and Robert, and I, I'm, there's a few others, but you guys are up here, man. Uh, man always have, a, I'll never forget you. Like I encountered some of the students, I can't remember their names. I can see you when I'm 80 and I'll still be able to recognize you, brother. So <laughs> I, I appreciate it. That's what's up. So much love, much love. Blessings, man, blessings. You want to give a shout out, man, to your family, man, and there you? Absolutely. Shout out to you know my my sons, TJ, Terrell, Scooter, uh, you know my lovely wife. Uh, I'm here. This is Mr. Banks. I know my children had the opportunity of meeting you at um, Bleep's fight. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know you've you've talked and 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 mentored um, Terrell, my middle uh, son. So just want to give a shout out and all, also to my Laco family, my friends back at in L.A., Los Angeles County Office of Ed. Much love. Big that. Hey, man, get his brother a raise, man. You see what happens, man. <laughs> sure. Give him a raise. <laughs> give him a raise. Hey, that's right on time because we're in the midst of negotiations right now. Man, for real, because he earned, man. He done, man, boy, boy. McGlover, man, what's up, man? Where they find you at, man? man? they find me right here at the spot on the spot, man. Coming back. I'm back. He done bailed me out, so I'm back on. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man, McGlover, man, you know, your man, your full time father, man. So sometimes when y'all don't see him, he on daddy duty, man. Roll so you know roll what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> All day. So if y'all see him, man, doing a donkey kick, man, in one of these skating rings, man, you know, just laugh at him and yep. stuff like you that. You see me skating am. backwards with your ain't he? I'm just having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Again, man, I want to thank, man, you know, doctor. I'm going to talk that into, man, I'm going to talk that into. Right there, the blessing from God, man. Doctor, Mm -hmm. Mr. Inglewood, native himself, Mr. Tedrick Johnson, man. I just want to thank you, man, once again, man. I want want to thank you for the invite, man. As I stated before, all of you guys have accepted me with open arms, and you've been nothing but, you know, extremely Mm -hmm. nice. And I want to thank you for having me, man. So I'm humbly here to say much love and respect and continue doing what you're doing in the community, man. It's nothing but future blessings for all of you. Man, dig, man. Blessings, man. To them Johnson boys, y'all don't even know, man. You guys is like royalty to some real cats out here, brother. So always remember, man, you guys hold, man, his lineage and you hold his last name, man. Always keep your head up and stay prideful of that, man, because you got brothers that are rooting for y'all, man. 
thank you. Let me give a last shout out to my granddaughter. Oh, man, congratulations. Layla Johnson, I was born on September 20th, man, my first grandchild. So shout out to my granddaughter in, in Dallas, Texas. Yes, sir. Shout out to the man, the new legacy, man. Absolutely. And we over here on the spot at the spot, man. Like, comment, and subscribe. Man, Hit off top, man. The, hey, them MC Hammer, man. The MC yeah. Hammer draws come out, man. We, man, we get oh, up to man. a million likes, man. But Glover's gonna dance for us, man. The bumps <laughs> and the bumps, man. Touch <laughs> the camera.